Welcome inside another live edition of the Deep Look Podcast right here on the Ulti World YouTube channel. Tuesday, April 2nd. I need more music again. Uh, two weeks in a row. Got to keep the music going. Uh, it's Charlie Eisenhood alongside senior editor Keith Rayner. Keith, uh, a, a monster final regular season weekend of College Ultimate. Holy smokes, do we have a lot to get to today. We've 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 got a really big show, and it's funny because like over the Easter holiday, like my my family was hosting Easter, uh, so like I'm simultaneously like doing the Easter thing and the dad thing, and also like trying to keep an eye on all these games and who's getting the big wins, monitoring our betting league, uh, and so it was it was a nice you know sat down with uh, some of the big college basketball games uh, last night. Uh, go UConn, yep. good good to see a, a big win there, but. Uh, it, it was a, it was a lot, been a lot of sports to take in a lot of stuff to take in over the past uh, couple of days. Yeah. I bet on LSU last night because I was like, look, I got to fade the Caitlin Clark hype train wrong, wrong. Caitlin Clark drops 40, 40 points, uh, just absolutely on fire. And, uh, wow. What it's, uh, you know, the, the hype is real. The, do they play UConn now in the final four? Uh, I, I, let's see, it's, they do, they do, up against, Iowa, yeah, Iowa, UConn, for sure, yeah. and South Carolina, NC State. Who's taking it all? Who's taking the whole thing down, Keith? Make your call. Oof, I've been big on South Carolina is looks basically unbeatable. Uh, so I think I'm probably going to stick to my guns, but there's, there's some Caitlin Clark magic right now that like, feels like she's unfadeable. It's pretty you know, crazy. Like, it's pretty crazy. It, it's, it's really wild. I will say watching last night, Juju Watkins is probably my new favorite player. I mean, I know that they've <laughs> lost. She didn't even have that great a game. She like, I don't know, made like nine field goals. Broke, she broke the, the freshman scoring record, but, uh, She's so smooth. I can't wait for another year of Juju Watkins. She is so dope. I'm a big fan, big fan now. I mean, the women's college game is in a great place right now. And, you know, men's college basketball kind of sucks because so many people leave to go to the NBA. Um, headlines from the Frisbee weekend that was over at Eastern's Georgia defeats UMass 15 11 in the final. They take down Eastern's for the first time that I can never remember. I, I, maybe they've won it long ago, but um, at, first time in a long time. Um, and over at the East Coast Invite, Vermont beats UNC twice, including in the final 12-10, and they take down the ECI. Uh, UNC losing again after falling at Northwest Challenge. So uh, much to get to. We'll get to that in a little bit. But first, it's time for our trivia question of the week. All right, trivia question of the week. And uh, this is, uh, in my experience, some of people's favorite trivia in all of Ultimate. Charlie, it's <laughs> time for a little college Ultimate nickname quiz. What team names are, are out there? Can you identify the college and uh, the division that that team plays in based on the nickname? Are you ready? I've got, I got five for you. I am ready, but I think we should, we should talk a little Sunset Lakes and then you should give them to me. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So we could, uh, we could talk about our friends over at sunset lakes. Now they believe that CBD shouldn't be just for the privileged few. So their vertically integrated farm cuts out the middleman and provides affordable products for everyone. Plus they are majority employee owned and I come from a union organizing household. So I'm a very pro worker. So very into that. Uh, I, I mentioned my family posted Easter, uh, I had a tough morning with with uh, with Miles, and I had a rough night's sleep, so I was not really in the mood to have a bunch of people over to the house to get the, to get things flowing a little bit. Party went off without a hitch. Had a great time hanging out with everybody. Miles is uh, a terrible Easter egg hunter. He finds like three eggs, and then he's off to he was like started playing with bubbles or something. He's, he doesn't get it the Easter egg thing. Uh, but I had a good time. It seemed like <laughs> everybody else did too. And uh, I think the vibe gummies were a nice little trick up my sleeve. Now you can get yourself some vibe gummies uh, or any of uh, Sunset Lakes' other awesome products. You can do that at sunsetlakecbd.com. You'll get 20% off with our coupon code, Deep Look. That's all one word, Deep Look. Farmer owned, Vermont grown, Sunset Lake CBD. All right, Charlie. Trivia question of the week. Let's go. I got five college team nicknames for you. 
Here we go. All right. First up, the Merry Men. William and Mary, easy start, easy start. That's the men's team. Yeah. D1. Yes. Uh, a new team name, but uh, but I think a nice nice little layup to, to kick you off. How about Doom? I know this. I'm going to let people think about it for a second. I don't want to, I don't, I want to give people a chance at home before I say the answer. Uh, that would be Syracuse and D1 men's. All right. Syracuse men's. That is correct. Uh, maybe I think they used to be Scooby doom, but I'm, I'm, I'm not positive about that. Uh, all right. How about stacked cats? Uh Oh, <laughs> cats. I'm going to guess it's D3 women's and go with stacked cats. I don't, I, I genuinely do not know. Swarthmore, right, but I guess, no, that's wrong. Playing... They're war mothers. Yeah, they have a great team name. The, I'll give you a hint. The stacked cats played at ECI. Really? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to look at the team list, but I, I just, just so that I can see the names in front of me. Um, is it Ohio? It is Ohio. Ah. Stacked cats. Right, I now, think I now, knew that in the, hard, the depths these... of my brain. Ohio is not a team that we see a lot of tournaments. So okay. No, but they, they've they've been to nationals. They've been they've been in the picture. They have, they're, they're, they they're have. The I should I should know it. I I All do right. I do know it, but far deep far deep in I my got... brain. I got two hard ones for you. So these these are these right. are above and beyond. If you know these, you you are indeed one of uh, the 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 sickos in our Discord. But um, I would just like to right. say, ultra world, ultra world commentator and editor and podcaster, our our uh, friend of the show over on the Huck and A podcast, Theo Wan, has an amazing ability to name co- college team name and like mascots for any college in the United States. And he's Canadian. It's unbelievable. You can come up with the most obscure teams and he will nail it. So let's see if I can uh, get a little of that energy right now. So I'll give you both. One's, one's from the women's division, one's from the men's division. The two okay. team names are Air Raid and Terror. Air Raid and Terror. <sighs> Jeez. I've heard, I've heard Air Raid, but I have no recollection. I'm going to... Is that Temple Men's? Uh, you're you're not that far off, like as far as name idea, but it's not Temple. Okay, what's Temple? Temple is Alert. Oh, that, oh that one that's pretty close. Let's be honest, that's pretty close. Yeah, that's I, um, yeah. You were in the neighborhood. That's it. Air raid, and what was the other one? Terror. Terror. Uh... No, I'm thinking of Kansas Horizontals. Terror. <laughs> um, this is a hard one. This is not hard. Tulane. Tulane is Tux. I, I I don't know. I give up. All right. Uh, Terror is Alabama Huntsville in the women's division. The thematically oh, okay. connected to the nightmares. Uh, yeah. And Air Raid, Washington State men's division. Air Raid. Washington State? These, I, I pull these... I don't even know. I pulled they were these directly team. from USAU. So if the if these teams Washington call themselves State. something else, they need to update USA Ultimate. Yeah, that's now. that's ultra hard USA. mode. That, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah that's... Have I ever said the name Washington State on this podcast? I don't think so. Um, I have one for you. You got to be sick of it now. Okay. It's just it's, for whatever reason I've always liked this name because it's just so strange. Helpful corn. You're gonna know this. Oh yeah, I for sure know this. Uh, that's definitely University of Maryland women's division. I've yeah, I've I've been around helpful corn many a time, but it is it is one of the most unique names in the game. All right, it is time to welcome in a uh, former European editor at Ulti World, uh, Robbie Vasu Davin, and uh, he's here representing <clears throat> the European Ultimate Federation uh, Competition Committee, and uh, we welcome in Robbie to the podcast right now. Robbie, how you doing? Hey Charlie, hey Keith, how's it going? Doing good. We are doing well. Uh, we've got some stuff to talk about, uh, about European Ultimate, because we've got a whole new club structure over there. Um, and yeah. so 
I guess it would be great to hear maybe a quick synopsis for those who are not, you know, following European Ultimate too much. What is the former structure that the club scene in Europe has had, and what are we moving to now? Just kind of in a in a nutshell. Yeah, sure. So, like I said, I'm rep- I'm here representing the European Ultimate Federation. The European Ultimate Federation is a group of national federations, basically. So the EUF's members are like the different nations and their federations. So every club team that plays in Europe will play in their own national championship. So the top Belgian teams will play each other, top German teams play each other, whatever. And the EUF has this sort of bigger structure, kind of like the Champions League in soccer, which is like the top clubs from all the different European countries come together and play the European series. And... um Previously, it worked that the national championships were basically equivalent to sectionals in the U.S., where if you were a top X team from your country, you would then advance to regionals, which regions would be a group of countries. So I, I'm in the Netherlands. We were in the central region. We were in a region with Denmark, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And like, so the top teams from all those countries would come together and play regionals somewhere. And then each of those regions would get a bid to the EUCF, which is our big prime event, um, very, like our equivalent to US nationals. Although those we do have our other national championships, that's usually for the top teams, not really what they're aiming for. They're aiming to play at the EUCF. So instead of sexuals, regional nationals, we have nationals, regionals, and then Europeans. And that's how it's been working for a long time. This has got great buy-in. It is like the most elite prestigious club tournament of the year. There's many other things going on, but everybody's going and trying to win that UCF gold. Um, and about five years ago, um, during the pandemic, at some point, the uh, a committee was put together to kind of change things and see if we can phase things out a little bit. Um, so the new structure is now we've gotten rid of regionals completely. And we have a few tournaments that give wildcard bids out. So we have like this elite invite, which is kind of like the US Open, where the top teams from the previous year's nationals or the previous year's UCF from in our case uh, get to play. The winner of that gets an UCF spot no matter what. And then at the end of the season, what we're replacing regionals with are called summer tours. And teams that win those tournaments also get spots. Um, and I can tell you how you get put into those tournaments in a sec, but yeah, so those are like wildcard spots and that's like four to five, uh, spots per division men's women's uh, sorry, open women's and mixed. And then the rest of the ranking spots, the rest of the spots for UCF are determined by a ranking algorithm. And we're using those basically the same algorithm that USAU uses for club and college. And instead of having that decide how many bids each region gets, we're just saying, that's going to decide directly who qualifies. So you have to get yourself in there, unless you win a wild card, get yourself in there, make sure you have your 10 sanctioned games. And um, yeah, it's just going to use the ranking algorithm to qualify teams directly. So it would be like in USAU, if instead of regionals, you had some tournaments that weekend, but they don't decide all the bids. But then after that weekend, you rerun the whole algorithm with the whole season all together and the top teams all get to go based on the ranking, not on games to go and and that kind of thing. Very unusual system. I, I, obviously, you can see the parallels with what's going on in you know how how club and, and college are structured here in the U.S. and 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 this new change. But how are people responding to this new format? Yeah, so far it's gotten a lot of really good feedback. We've um, run the ranking a little bit on last year's data because there were some tournaments that the EUF put together. Um, we just said, okay, what would it look like if we did that? Um, last year, we still used regionals to qualify, but we did it as a kind of a test case. And you, it, it, it passes the smell test. The top teams are where you would think they would be. I mean, I think if you look at the top USAU rankings at the end of the season, it's not like crazy usually. You, it's usually pretty accurate for where teams are. Um, so most teams are happy with it. We'll see at the end of this year when some team gets some team always gets left out right and if you get left out because you're off by a couple of ranking points versus you get left out because you lost a game to go we'll see how teams feel about that when that's when really comes down to it but so far people are happy with it one issue we had in the past was that regionals was the same thing every year the same teams are always going and teams are kind of complaining about that that like they have to go a lot of the top teams, they know they're going to qualify, but they sometimes have to fly out to another country to play regionals. 
and teams just weren't that happy about that. This new format allows teams to actually don't even have to go to that weekend if they don't want to. They can they can get all their ranking points in earlier tournaments. So it's a little more flexible, and that's also helpful in Europe because regionals is usually in August ish, September ish, which in Europe, people have a lot of vacation days, like to actually take holidays away from Frisbee in that period. So sometimes teams come with shells of themselves to regionals and then are together for the fall for the UCF. Now teams can decide, okay, we'll just get all our ranking points in the spring and summer and hope we qualify that way, or we'll try try our luck and get in that summer tournament. So it adds flexibility and it gets rid of this kind of mandatory regionals thing that I think some teams didn't like. Yeah, I think this is the the interesting question that I would have is at the mar right the top teams are going to qualify in either system, so like the teams yeah. that are in the semifinals of the EUF or UCF, like it's not they, they don't care one way or the other. Maybe they prefer the new system because there's not this extra regionals tournament that feels like a burden to them, but it's all about the marginal teams. How do you feel like this is going to affect those marginal teams? Is this going to, in theory, this should produce a higher quality EUCF because borderline teams that like get extra bids for a region aren't going to be there and instead it's just going to straight up be who plays well during the season yeah yeah so I think that's that's the thing so I would say the upsides for marginal teams is you earn your way in for this through the season and it's like whichever team did the hard work for the whole year gets the spot rather than a team swooping in and stealing the bid at regionals and they don't put in any of the work to earn anything for their region, which is a complaint I know happens in USAU. So that's one benefit, And but for, for marginal teams. Of course, the flip side of that is that maybe you'll learn quite early on in the season that you're so far away from the top 16 that you're not going to be in. So you never have that kind of like that feeling that, okay, well, okay, well, we can still earn it at the end. And that's actually why we added that all the summer tour events, which happen on the last weekend of the season, they are wildcard events. So if you win that tournament, even if your season's not doing great, you can earn yourself a bid by winning a tournament. Now, the way it works is we announce, so now, now the EUF gives a spring tour, elite invite, and summer tour. So the spring tour and summer tours are basically every team that wants to buy into the system can buy in and you will you have to submit at the beginning of the year like, you know where all the tournaments are going to be. You give like your ranked choice of where you want to go. And then at the beginning of the year, the EUF will place you randomly, not randomly, but try and place you with um, your your top choice where you're going to go. And the, the, the thing is that you can't like try and go into a weak tournament because you have no idea which other teams are, are applying to what. So you only have to do it based on like which locations you're willing to go to. Then the EUF is going to put you into those tournaments. And if you drop out of one after that, you're immediately disqualified. So you can't like game the system Love by it. saying like, oh, we don't like that. If you miss an EUF official event, you're out. That's that's just the way it is. Um, so yeah, so you, you, it's yeah. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Um, if you have any more questions. Well, I, one of the questions that that stands out to me is, you know, obviously when the, and this is something that was probably a part of the previous system that I, I'm I'm not aware of, but obviously when you're working with all of these different organizations and teams coming from various communities, how are you monitoring like roster, the rostering process? You know, is, is there, can a team load up for, you know, winning one of these qualifying events and then, or load, like try just win in that way. Like how, how does the rostering work as far as you know, where players have to be in by certain dates? Yeah. So this is something we, we had to adapt last year. We did a kind of, I, I didn't still tell the full story last year. We had a sort of hybrid system where we had spring invite events and elite invite and those spring invite ones had wild cards. And, uh, um, Don Demare, which is the top, top player in Europe last year, went out with his home club, which is jet set. He plays for Mooncatchers internationally, but he's actually from a different city in Belgium. And he played with them at spring invite and along with a couple other strong pickups, one spring invite and then transferred over to moon catchers for us the season. And then, so kind of one jet set a bid and then left and, and whatever. So we, <laughs> we've had to institute some rules. It's always the Belgians that mess things up. You know, when the Belgian U 20 team came over with Arvid Zolovskis and Ben Orton almost beat the U S that's when they got rid of the community member rule in the WIFDIF. So the Belgians always try to, <laughs> to pick at your rules and, 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 <laughs> and, uh, see what you can do. Um, so we have a new rostering system, basically, in March, so right now, it was, it was actually the end of March, just happened, it was the deadline. You have to submit your, what we call master roster. 
and you can, no player can be on two master rosters at once. So you have to be on one master roster somewhere. And every event where you want where you, where you want games to count, which is either an EUF official event or like there are other sanctioned tournaments like Tom's Tourney, Windmill, all the big tournaments, they're all sanctioned. So if you play against, if two EUCS, what we call EUCS, the European Ultimate Club season now, if two ECS teams play basically anywhere throughout the season, those games will count towards the ranking system. Um, but if you want them to count, you have to submit your tournament roster, which has to be a subset of your master roster, and you're not allowed to play with anybody else. And you can add people that aren't in the system as many times as you want, and there's no limit to how many players you can have, so we're being very flexible there. But transfers are limited. So transfers are now limited between um, May 15th and June and July 15th, which is basically in between the elite invite and before the last weekend in the, in the summer tour, you're allowed to transfer players. And for the open division, a team can only take in three ta transferred players. And in mixed and women's, you can take in uh, five transferred players. So if a team's going to, player's going to move from one team to another, there's limitations on that for the team that's receiving them. Um, and that's what we're trying out this year to put some restrictions on it, but yeah, master roster subset. And then there's a little bit of a transferring that's allowed. People are going to start loaning out players. They're going to start paying <laughs> each other to loan out players. It's going to be like soccer. It's all started. <laughs> this is it. Um, but the elite invite before you... the transfer period and teams are going to want to play like that's going to be the highest level tournament of the season. Right. So you don't want to loan out your players for that one. And so you kind of can only do it after that, which is, yeah, that's uh, that's it tricky. gives people flexibility to play with a home team or something like that early in the season. It makes sense. I mean, we see the same thing in USAU. Yeah. Uh, how do you, do you, do you think that there's anything that USAU could take from this concept to use over here? I know you follow the game pretty close, so maybe you have an yeah. opinion. Yeah. I mean, this is something USAU could do really. I mean, you all always ask, how could you make the regular season matter more? And I think you do usually mean towards those teams that are going to qualify regardless of the system. So maybe this wouldn't make Fury care about the regular season more than they would uh, in the other system. But if qualification directly happens through the ranking algorithm rather than through regionals, um, I think at least the marginal teams are going to have to take the regular season really seriously. And those Canadian teams that come in and swoop up bids will have to actually come and get their sanctioned games and earn it. So like that's something you could consider or you could consider a hybrid system where like maybe some bids are decided by the top X in the ranking and some bids are decided by regionals for those teams that don't come in. But like just give more teeth to the ranking, believe in the ranking and, and think that that's a better way to assess who the teams are than regionals. Now, of course, the drawbacks, there's two main drawbacks I see. One is, of course, the drama of games to go. I mean, friend of uh, all of us, Pat Stegemeller, maybe the best day of his life, one of the best days of his life was winning that game to go when he was the upset team. And those kind of stories we lose. And we know that that's something that we, we do lose, right? Um, and the other is guaranteeing regional diversity. So now there's no longer a, uh, that a, a region. We kind of got rid of the concept of region. So there's no longer a guarantee that each region gets a, gets a representative at nationals or UCF. Um, this just kind of lets it all go. And in theory, let's say the top 10 teams are all German, then it would be a super boring looking tournament for us. Right now, we looked at the top, you know, 20, 25 teams and it's pretty diverse ar around Europe, but that could change in the future and we would might have to reassess that. But yeah, I think USA, you could give more teeth to the ranking and do that, but it would be a huge change for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been saying for years, they need to give, if you win a TCT event, you get an auto bid to nationals. It, it, yeah. it comes with problems. Nothing is perfect. The current system at least gives everybody these clear weekend where like, this is where you have to play well if you want to go to nationals. And you can improve your odds of going to nationals by playing well during the season. Um, but it does feel like a lot of the time, the TCT events are sort of just like, okay, like we're kind of seeing how teams are, but they don't have a lot of value in and of themselves. I love the idea mm -hmm. that you can win some of these um, these European tournaments during the summer and guarantee yourself a spot. Now, the thing is, who are the teams that are winning these things? I mean, it's the teams that are going to qualify anyway. So like, yeah, it, nothing is perfect, but I do think it's a, a good adjustment for Europe specifically because the number of like competitive high quality teams 
is, I mean, first of all, you take more teams to EUCF than the U USAU, right? I th isn't it like we changed that this year? To... Actually, we're back to we're, oh, it's, it's it used to be used to be twenty four open, and then like twelve to sixteen women's and mixed, depending on how it, how many teams are interested. Now we've women's and mixed have developed enough that we can get sixteen every time. So we're making it sixteen for all three now. So that's uh, that is changing. So the this year. so the men's bids are being cut down. Interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So the thing is, I think in the U.S., like there's so many more teams that I think people would really not like a system in which they felt they had no option, they absolutely no chance to make nationals. Like so part of the beauty of the system, and this is maybe an American thing in some ways, is it's like <laughs> you can believe that you have that one great weekend and that's what it takes to be yeah. able to go to the national championships. And I guess in theory, that's true of the European system as well. Uh, because like if you went and you played amazing at one of these events, then you probably lock yourself up a bid. But mm -hmm. it's just, it's like, it's kind of like you have multiple regionals throughout the year in a way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And, and like we have that last tournament last weekend of the year that there are wild cards. So you still can have a crappy season and right. still get that last shot, but you can't control who's in that tournament. So if La Fota is in your, in your summer tour tournament, like, yeah, you have to get through a top four team to get there, but you still have the chance. Um, but I think I think one thing, because I remember when you talked, um, I forget who was on uh, talking from the USAU about thinking about the different systems and how it would work in the future, is that they they want everybody to be included in the USAU nationals structure, and is that really like, does that even make sense in in some ways that like every team has to be playing at that nationals level? So here at the EUF thing, there are many European club teams that aren't going to play in our structure. Most, most club teams are not, most club teams are going to play their national championship and that's it. And they just, they don't, they don't care about playing at the European level, but that that's, I think there's a difference there because the, the, the monetary differences are a little bit there in that the EUF gets player fees and tournament fees, um, from the events. And that's not gonna, you know, EUCF is going to have the same number of teams, no matter what. So that's not, that's not really a thing for us. And even regionals was set to a certain number of teams, no matter what. So that wasn't a big deal. And the EUF's members are not the players. The EUF's members are the national federations and the federations then have to have the players yep. as their members. So this was like, the EUF is like, we just care about the European level, but that doesn't have to include everybody. Other people have other opportunities to play. And in the US you have, you know, city leagues and all kinds of opportunities. Does everybody need to be playing at the national, in the national system? Um, that's something to think about. I think that USAU has to figure out, but from, from a competitive structure standpoint, you're totally right. But from a financial standpoint, there's no way USA Ultimate's ever going to change this. Th there have been yeah. multiple <laughs> years in which the reason that I bought a USA Ultimate membership was so that I could play at sectionals. Mm -hmm. And that was the only reason. And otherwise I wouldn't have bought one. Yeah. And I guarantee you there are probably at least uh, probably thousands of people for whom that is true. Yeah. So. I and think players don't buy that, that's EUF a lot of money. memberships. Right. Players don't buy EUF memberships. They pay tournament fees to go to the tournaments, but you don't buy an EUF membership. So that's a totally different incentive structure in how EUF thinks about designing our structure compared to USAU. Um, Although now, maybe maybe you, you need to add a, a you need to add like a, a membership that you can buy for UCF, and it gets you. A bid, you know, you can just buy your way in for one, just just one, just one, just one auctionable bid. Uh, you know, revenue generating is, is important. You know, how much would someone yeah. pay for a bid? I wonder. <laughs> Thousands, I would imagine, of euros. Um, Thousands of okay. Euros. So uh, there's this new rankings page, ranking.ultimatefederation.eu, and this is your work, yeah. right, Robbie? So if yeah, you want to check this, it out and. We'll drop it in the chat. Yeah, I made I made this because we thought that it was. Um, sorry, sorry, jumping on you. There. No, go ahead. Yeah, so I I made this up. Um, very very highly influenced by um, frisbeerankings.com, but this one's a bit more feature rich, and um, I thought since the ranking algorithm is going to be so important, people have to be able to follow this easily throughout the season, and if you go here, um, I think especially. You can, you can see how the ranking evolves throughout the year. You can see which teams are in the cutoff, which teams aren't in the cutoff. So here you can 
see the teams in yellow are the ones that have won wild cards. The teams in green are the ones that are fighting for ranking points. Um, and one really cool feature I think people would like to see if you click on the matchup tab, if you get a chance to go there, you can put in any two teams and you can see all the games they played against each other. You can see all the games they played against mutual opponents. So it's really good for commentators to be able to talk history of the two teams. And it also gives a predicted score based on the algorithm. So if you, you can you could take the difference in ranking between rating between the two teams and you can reverse calculate what that is estimated to be in a game to 15. And it'll it'll show you like, OK, this this game is supposed to be 15, 11. And so you can um, if you're about to like go up against another team, you can say, oh, the algorithm predicts us to be a 15, 11. So I have to beat that on either side of it. And that's kind of what you're playing for to improve your your ranking. Um, right. So right. there's a few different features like that. Um, and this this yeah. this could all still be implemented in the USAU uh, ranking system as well. It's just, it's the same. <laughs> it's basically the same algorithm. So yeah, you I know, know, it's, it's kind of funny that we rely we, on we, an independent website. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's tough times out here, to be honest, in the uh, in the website department. Um, well, Robbie, this is very cool. I'm excited to see how this plays out, and I'm sure that we're going to have some, you know, bid drama just like in the U.S. Uh, but it'll just be about like those final games of the season. And like, can they score at least 12 goals in this game? <laughs> it's going to be kind of crazy because people will kind of know what they need to do. Right. Yeah. And there's that blowout rule. You got to get over six. If you're like a low team against a high team, you want to get to that seven points. So the game can't be discarded. And if you're a, <laughs> if you're a high team, you want to make sure like games that are right, like 14, six are going to be dirt. like power line universe point lines on <laughs> for 14. <six. laughs> Uh, good stuff. All right. Hey, Robbie, we'd love to have you back for our subscriber bonus segment out the back to talk about the world championships, which are coming up here. We're not so far away. End of August, beginning of September. You willing to come join us for that? Sure will. See you there. All right. Well, we'll see you. We'll see you in the discord in, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, Robbie Vasudevan with us here talking European ultimate. Appreciate it, Robbie. Thanks, guys. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Easterns, East Coast Invite. We're talking bids. College postseason is upon us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to deep look um i want to talk first keith about bids now we don't have official usau rankings yet and there's definitely question marks because it's unclear what we're going to do uh with dropped games because if you have an ineligible player uh and it would have helped your rankings to include that game they're going to drop it so it's going to get complicated here uh and every year it feels like a, a bit or two changes hands because of this but knowing what we know now and thank you so much to cody mills for all the work he does to keep frisbeerankings.com up to date um let's take a look at what happened this weekend in the bid picture and we'll start in the men's division keith mcgill they went and they won east coast invite but they blew it for another bid for new england uh, they dropped 10 spots to 25th, and uh, that's all she wrote for uh, an additional bid for New, New England. They're going to end up with just three. Well, I, I don't know if it's fair to place all the blame on McGill. I mean, Tufts and Northeastern also were in action this weekend and are just at the margins. They, you know, Had they played a little bit better, uh, maybe they could have made up for, uh, for McGill's mistake, which was just simply not winning by enough or choosing to go to that tournament altogether. One of those two. Um, so I, I don't know if I place all the blame squarely on McGill, but certainly they have the big red down arrow next to their name on Frisbee rankings. Well, sure. I mean, I think it, it, you make a fair point, but they were in and now they're out uh, relative yeah. to, you know, Northeastern and Tufts who are sitting just outside the cutoff. Uh, but tough sledding for New England. I, it's going to be an exciting regional. I mean, obviously... UMass, Brown, uh, great teams, Vermont, uh, they're all in the top 10. But I, I think it's clear that those 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 the other teams could compete and steal a bid. They, they absolutely could. 
we've seen it plenty of times before. I mean, that we've seen many an upset at at uh, New England men's division regionals, and so I I think everybody's going to be on alert for that same thing to happen again. Hopefully, we get some some clear weather, uh, so that doesn't make things too wonky. But I don't think even those top teams are going to walk in there feeling totally safe. As it stands, uh, Wash U is the last team in. This again is all unofficial at the moment, um, but Wash U moving up eight spots, uh, and that's thanks to a strong performance at Huck Finn, and uh, because BYU will not be playing at conferences, that that bid, the second bid for the Northwest drops out. Wash U will take that spot, which means a one bid Northwest. Keith, wow. Oh man, that is a tough, tough outcome. And to me, I stand by disappointing from a spectator standpoint. I think Oregon's going to be the heavy favorite. And I would have loved the drama of at least one more bid because there's so many worthy contenders uh, for that spot. I don't know. Are you sure that Oregon State um, won't be also be in the mix to get a to get a second oh, I'm, bid? I'm for sorry. The I'm sorry. No, I, 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 my mistake. I don't know what I was looking at. Um, it'll be a two bid Northwest. You're, you're totally right. Okay. They, they are the current actual bubble team, but it's going to fall down from BYU to wash you. Uh, but Oregon state is in. No, I I'm, I'm sorry. You're right. Um, and, uh, but there are a lot of additional there, Northwest teams that just, that just miss out, uh, Washington at 22, UBC at 24, Utah state at 26, um, Utah at 30. So you've got a ton of teams fighting probably for that, that second bid. I mean, it could have been a disaster for the Northwest. I mean, if, if either of those New England teams that we just mentioned had played better at uh, at Easterns, then it could have been a really abject disaster. Uh, and the Southwest also this season, escaping disaster. It looked like they had a chance of being a one-bit region as well. Uh, that that did not come to pass. But scary scary times for uh, for the West in the, in the men's division, albeit not so much in the women's division. <laughs> Uh, two, just two one bid regions. Illinois uh, gets the auto bid for the Great Lakes at 40th in the rankings, and the auto bid for the Metro East goes to SUNY Buffalo at 90th in the rankings. Brutal times for the Metro East, Keith. Yeah, make get your jokes off. I I, I think it's a little tired, but I, I also would like the region to uh, to also not be so tired. <laughs> uh, of course, much more analysis to come once we have official rankings. Um, so that's unofficial. We move over to the women's division where, you know, regardless of what happens kind of at the border with the official rankings, there's basically half the bids are going to the West coast right now. Northwest sitting with six and the Southwest with four. Um, I guess it's possible that Victoria could lose that sixth bid if there's some weirdness with, uh, thrown out games, but that's where it stands. Um, the, the evil empire back in full force, Keith. For sure. I mean, the, you there were two one bid regions in in men's and there are six five in women's five i think i think or it six. is six there's six ac oh great lakes God, metro east north brutal. central ohio valley and southeast that's, that's absolutely brutal. brutal uh the the ohio valley has to be disappointed uh obviously great lakes you know we talked a little bit about notre dame situation but uh ohio valley Felt like they could have had anywhere from one to three teams. They're going to end up with one. That's going to be pretty disappointing for them. Um, it, it's it's a tough year. Uh, New England's probably a little bit disappointed. You know, Metro East came we came into the season felt like they could have earned two. Uh, instead, they're sitting with one, and it's it's not pretty. So tough situations for basically everybody, but the 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 rich. You know, the, the, there's a have and have nots regional breakdown right now. Yeah, New England narrowly missing out on a third bid uh, with uh, Northeastern sitting there. BYU is expected to play conferences. Just want to note that. Um, that would lock up that sixth bid for the Northwest. If they do not play, um, then it would drop to Northeastern, again, all unofficially. So one interesting note, Keith, that I just wanted to bring up today, um, and I, I actually messaged Matthew Borland, who's the USAU college director, and he, he said that he's aware of this situation. There's no clarity at all about what might happen. But with this many bids for the Northwest and a likely one bid conferences for BYU, 
there's a realistic chance that they would have an opportunity to earn a nationals bid on so they would play conferences on saturday and they could advance to regionals at regionals they might be able to earn a bid on day one now the rules say that you have to play out these games except for basically the last seeding game you're allowed to forfeit that one um, in the postseason but as it stands byu wouldn't be eligible most likely be depending on the format um but they might have done enough already to earn a bid i wonder if there's a world in which usau would allow byu if they were to do enough to earn a bid on day one at regionals to advance to nationals with the knowledge that you know if they got to sunday which would be quarterfinals um they would have to 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 just withdraw and forfeit yeah, we, we, you and I were talking about this off air, and you you had mentioned the idea that that BYU kind of might force USAU's hand, and I was I knew USAU had their had their bases covered here. This was not ever really going to be uh, a problem, I think, unless for some reason, uh, you know, Sunday of regionals got canceled for for rain or something like that, and the bids had been the situation had been already set up. Like that would be an unusual circumstance, right? If BYU, I don't know, had made it to the final, which had an auto bid. And so they were in the final and them and them and Oregon automatically get bids and Sunday gets rained out or something. I don't know what they would do in that situation. But uh, as is, I, I think that they were always secure on that front. I do think one wrinkle that you didn't mention is uh, the new 60 point forfeit penalty uh, that to regular season rankings. That's another thing that could come up uh, in second order effects as far as like, um, as far as, you know, once games start getting thrown out and we have to do the whole, you know, final cleanup phase that USAU does, it's kind of a black box for us on the outside. Nobody really knows what the outcomes are going to be because uh, we don't have all the information. But there are some, there is a new rule where I think there's a 60 point penalty or total rankings for uh, for forfeiting games. That's and that correct. could impact some teams. So keep an yeah, eye out for that. I'm sure too. it will. Who knows? I mean, we saw some big changes last year. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some again. Um, I just want to stake stake the claim here. I think if there's a if there is a feasible path for BYU to qualify on Saturday of regionals, and they do so, that they've they, they've they've gotten to locked into a bid, they should USAU should allow them to play at nationals. What is the what is the harm? What is the downside? I, I guess you could say there's a competitive problem. Like if they yeah. get to pre quarters, what do you do then? But I don't know. I just feel like. You should let them play if they've done enough to earn it by Saturday night at regionals. So the 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 problem was never can they get to nationals? It's can we do nationals with BYU? Like I don't think the problem was ever like yeah okay so they that's that's not fair to say regionals was part of the problem. Like okay regionals is is a problem, but but a bigger part of the problem was always if BYU were at nationals, how would we run nationals in a way that's fair? So I I I think there's. There's no way this would happen. <laughs> I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. I, I I think it's not that big of a problem. Um, and if it if it means that they get to pre quarters and have to auto forfeit and somebody else gets a, an auto spot in the in the quarterfinals, then that's not the worst thing in the world. So, uh, you know, let 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 me know what you think in the chat. Email us deeplook at ultyworld .com. What do you think? Um, and again, this is all they they would have to probably beat teams ranked higher than them in a very deep and difficult Northwest region for this even to be a possibility. So, you know, they might not be able to get it done on Saturday, which renders the whole point moot. Um, all right, let's move on. Keith, we got to talk about Easterns. What the heck? What the heck was going on at Easterns? <laughs> Every more, more of the same at the top of this division in college men's has proven to be able to win on any given Sunday. And this time, Georgia gets the big wins. They beat Vermont, Cal Poly Slow, and UMass in three consecutive games in the championship bracket uh, and, and take it down. And, uh, you know, that, those were not, that was not the only crazy result this weekend. But is Georgia a championship contender now? Do we have to, do we have to say that? Well, yeah, of course. Of course. I mean, were they, 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 were now... they before? 
Uh, I would say they were like a tier two contender in my mind. Like they were a team competing yeah. for a semifinal spot. Uh, but you know, look at look at what they've done. They've won Florida warm up. The only team they lost to at Smoky Mountain Invite was UMass, and then they beat that UMass team at Easterns. Like th- their resume has every hallmark of a team that could win a championship in this environment. Uh, so they're, they're Scotty clear Whitley, contender. breakout are they, player are they of the year, the baby. number one team in the power rankings this week? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I mean, they've beaten. Who have they not beaten? I guess they they never played UNC this season. Yeah, they, they're, they, they're not I two and one against UNC. UMass. They they are zero and one against Carlton. Uh, the only the only team besides UMass to beat them. So Carlton uh, is like know, the craziest roller coaster team right now. Like they get their asses kicked at Northwest Challenge, and then they come out. Uh, to Easterns and like get some shock wins. They beat UMass. I mean, this was a really very kind of wild tournament. Now, Wyatt Kelman was out for UMass. He was in he was in street shoes. Um, so you know, take that with a grain of salt, I guess. But still, a, a pretty nice result for Carlton. They lose to Cal Poly slow, fifteen twelve. Um, slow missing a few people as well. I, I, what I guess wh- where do you where do you feel like things shake out for you after this weekend? Where we've now seen basically all the top teams lose at some point this season. Charlie, this is the most open title chase in the men's division I can remember since 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 Ultimate World started. I, I don't think there have been years when the title favorite wasn't clear, but even then it felt like there were three teams vying for it. There are like eight to ten teams that I could feasibly imagine beating the type of teams they have to do to, to to win nationals. Some of those teams I think are higher up in that in that tier list, but the the separation between those tiers is so thin right now, and it's a lot of it's going to come down to matchups. A lot of it's going to come down to who's hot at the right time because you're going to get to quarters, and it's going to be eight teams that are going to seem capable of beating the other seven teams in the bracket. Uh, I, I I am so excited about where where things are in the division right now i mean what when saturday was going on and pool play happens and uah beats slow i'm starting right. i started thinking about okay when when we have deep look we we have deep look is is, is uah gonna be a semis team like we we had said they're an outside <laughs> shot semis team like it's hard to uh they just beat slow like are, are they a semis team like they're in the mix at this point, right? And that where it have to be considered Oregon, in the mix. Colorado, Carlton. Yeah. Like, what are you doing with it? There are literally like 10 teams that feel like they could be at the top of that mountain when it all come, is said and done. And that's a ridiculous place to be at this point in the year. Yeah. I mean, UAH loses to Brown. Uh, they get thumped by Minnesota in Constellation. I mean, tough, tough break for them, right? They lose on point diff and miss the bracket. There's no pre quarters at Easterns. By a single um, I point. To, point I know. I would have loved to see them up against the teams in the bracket um, and get some more like sort of big, big games. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you can't say that they're not capable. I mean, for that team to beat Cal Poly, what, probably one of the like most uh, well coached and defensively oriented teams in the country, that's an amazing win for their resume going into nationals. Um, now they got to go navigate Southeast regionals. I feel very confident they're going to take their bid, but you know, there's, uh, if they can, if they can force, if other teams can force the disc into the hands of weaker throwers on UAH, I do think there's at least a opportunity for an upset there. It's not the deepest team in the world. Um, a, so one of these like 10 or 11 teams that they were looking at, one of them's not going to make nationals. That's, that's what I think. Somebody, think somebody's, we're gonna somebody's gonna miss. Someone's yeah, gonna blow it. Maybe it's maybe it's Vermont. Uh, maybe it's Colorado or something. I, Oregon. Like I don't the know. New England upset uh, potential is very real. Somebody, somebody's going down. Some somebody's going down. Um, how about Pitt? Kind of thumping UNC 15 12 in quarters. Is that the sh- thorough, what, thorough. what's the most shocking result of this tournament? Probably Carlton over UMass. Just based on yes. Carlton uh, like, playing so bad last weekend, but Pitt over U- yeah, UNC and, by and three playing is, back to back weekends cross wild. coast. I was I was very negative on them. Carlton over UMass is I was probably too. the biggest surprise, and then then Huntsville over over slow. 
to me is the yeah. those are the biggest surprises. But but man, Pitt Pitt over UNC. I mean, is it alarm time for UNC? I mean, if if your alarm is like we're not clearly vastly better than everybody we're playing against, if like that's the standard, then yes, then then the five alarm fire right now. Dev, <laughs> like, we're, but it, there's obviously you're still really good. Uh, just there, there's no there's no coasting. There's there's no coasting to be had here. Like they have to bring their A game. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it really does feel like it comes down to. You know, there, there's sometimes you go to nationals and there's teams that can play their absolute best game and still lose because they just don't have the talent. But I think if we go back to the beginning of the year, what was it? One of the things we were talking about is how talented the division is this year because of the six years and the continuity that that brings. And a lot of these teams we were talking about, right? You know, like a team like Pitt, they basically bring, bring back all their key contributors. And sure, they might not have like, done quite as much as we thought they would last year, but I think they showed some ceiling this weekend that they're capable of winning a title this season. Um, you know, Cal Poly, how good they've looked. Obviously, UMass has been fantastic. UNC is always going to be right there. Carlton has shown enough upside for me to think that they could upset just about anybody. Uh, you know, they play close with all the all the top teams. They get wins over UMass and Brown. They lose by two to Vermont. They lose by three to Cal Poly. So I agree with you. It comes down to matchups, but I also think it comes down to who is executing at the at the best level because I think any of the teams that play their A game can beat another team ba- playing its B game, and that is not always true. We're going to have at least eight teams capable of winning a title this season. Good luck making Very picks. Very exciting. <laughs> Good luck making picks. Are, are you are you talking to me? Because I because I'm going to be making picks. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'm talking to myself after the d- d- dismal season I've had. Um, Georgia over slow, like, man, Georgia was impressive this weekend, Keith. I think, what what, what do you, so I just said it earlier and I'm kind of glossed over it, but Scotty Whitley's level of play has been unbelievable. I, I mean, it, it, this team last year felt heavily reliant on basically two players. You know, you're looking at like, can Aiden Downey and Adam Miller like carry them? And now they have guys who are contributing at a high level. It feels a little bit to me like that Brown team that won in 2019. Um, so they have the superstars, but they also have these contrib- these these players de- further down the roster that were playing incredible. Uh, I I still not sure I totally trust them when we get to nationals, but man, they they certainly uh, showed us something this weekend. For sure, I, and I, I actually don't really look at them with that Brown team, which I think felt a little more top heavy than this team, which has a lot of key contributors. I mean, they they get a a lot of different guys getting in there playing great defense for them. Uh, you know, they they Cole Chandler and Jake Powell are big offensive players for them too. Like, they 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 have a lot of different weapons, uh, maybe names that we don't quite know as well, but they're pretty deep, and uh, I think that. They have a nice blend in that in that sense. I wonder, like, are I actually wonder more? Like, are Adam Miller and Aiden Downey able to carry this team if they have to, uh, when necessary? Because I think that the that the the guys down the roster have done their part. Uh, Scotty Whitley, like you said, has been just absolutely tremendous this year. Uh, so chat chat uh, talking right now. Emmett points out that quarters at Easterns was eight of the top ten teams in the country. And the two missing teams were Oregon and Colorado, who were not there. So, this is this is what we got going on right now. Uh, I'm as as a Nationals preview. Eastern's really delivered, and I am super excited to see what happens. I mean, first these teams got to get through regionals, though. No easy buckets. <laughs> Shall we turn our attention to the East Coast invite, Keith? For sure, let's 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 get to it because uh, the, the, there's another North Carolina team that people are are throwing the washed accusations at. Okay, so well, let me let me bring it up right now. So Vermont goes two and zero against UNC, beats them fifteen eleven on Saturday, and then beats them in the final twelve ten. Uh, we knew Vermont was good. Um, you know they're now back to back tournament winners at Stanford Invite and East Coast Invite. They've beaten all the teams, right? They they I guess they they're zero and one against Carlton. Back yeah, in but they, the yeah, beginning of but February. But they've lost one game all year. 
and that's their only loss. They beat UBC, they beat UNC, who are I think the the teams that you look at as the as the you know the top two teams. So, I mean, for me, Vermont goes to number one in the power rankings, and uh, you know, I still stand by my fact that I think UBC is the best team in the country. But power rankings wise, it's not a question for me right now. Vermont's gotten there. Is there a problem with UNC? Are we seeing the end of the era? And I don't. I mean that for both divisions, Keith. Well, three straight, three straight championships for each team. Is it? Is this run over? Uh, I, I think that the era of, of them being dominant is is over. I would. I don't think that. I think both of these teams are definitely in title contention this year, and you know, seeing both of them win feels kind of unlikely at this point. That that parlay is is is, is going to get you big plus money. But either one could still pull it off. But you do wonder if like the the clip's gonna be empty a little bit after after this weekend, if if like that that just sheer dominance of them is is gonna be gone. Uh this was not their their best performance this past weekend. And and you could see that they they don't quite have that that gear of having, you know, four or five of the best players on the field that they can just turn to when they need to. Uh, Pleiades is not that team now. They they have to they have to be a little more reliant on system than they used to be, and a little more a little more reliant on on top the top end of a smaller group of players to carry the load. And and Vermont can kind of outclass them on that front. Here's what I'll say: I think a four peat for both teams is still very much in the cards, but the odds of that happening have gone down steadily over the course of the season. And I'm a little worried about the future for both programs. Not that I think they're going to disappear from nationals or something like that, but that they become quarters teams. Uh, where's the pipeline for UNC? I, I'm not seeing, like the superstar recruits aren't going to UNC. When Don Colton is gone, Pleiades starts to feel like they don't quite have a talent advantage anymore. And they've had one for a long time. Now, these things are cyclical. It could come back around. No no doubt about that. And frankly, on the men's side, so many of the tops are underclassmen still that they probably have another year or two of, of title window. But after that, after 2025, I, I harbor concerns about these teams' ability to continue to play at the highest level. Well, they're, they're still high quality youth ultimate to supply talent to these teams. It, they have lost out on a couple of high profile recruits lately, but you know, what, wasn't Jordan just winning a uh, major East Coast youth tournament uh, and a team from DC, which is not that far from Raleigh, winning uh, winning in the girls division? Like, there's there's still talent that could be attracted to these programs. Uh, you know, both still have good young players. Seth Freed and Bell Russell are each two of the best rookies in the vision uh, on their respective teams. So I, I think that they will be regular elite teams, which at this point feels disappointing for UNC to like be a team that's in the top 10 and not clearly fighting for like number one or number two in the title favorite. Uh, so I, I think that we got a little comfortable with them being so, so good that the game was all about, can anybody catch up to them? And it doesn't feel like they're going to be in that position after this year. Uh, but I still expect that, you know, the, look at other elite programs. And I think that that's what you'll be seeing. You know, what your Colorado's uh, across both divisions, your Oregon's, like these are teams that mostly ebb in and out of title contention and semifinal, quarterfinal contention. And like, I think that's probably where I expect this program to be after this year. All right. Well, let's talk about Vermont at the East Coast Invite. What impressed you, Keith, as they took down UNC twice? Oh, I mean, they're, they're, there's nothing new here, per se. They're still they're a big athletic team. They run hard. Kennedy McCarthy, Caroline Stone are awesome. Emily Posey is great. Uh, they have some depth. Like there, there are players that I think people are getting to know, uh, like Lauren Clater, who's having a great year for them. Uh, th those, those Sophie Acker is another player who she, I think she had four goals in the final. Uh, these are players who people are starting to get to know as this team is in more and more high profile opportunities, but they have the top end, they have the depth, they're super athletic. They're not the most disciplined, like super high execution team ever, but they're not like bereft of ability on that way, on, in that way. Like they can attack a zone offense 
pretty effectively. Uh, you know, they, they are there's enough like high level experience on the team to to help build some structure, but they're a bit freewheeling, but they're really good at it. And so I do think that makes them a little bit of a precarious team in some ways, but because they can they can kind of beat up people with their size and strength, the, the in a lot of ways they can they can make up for even when they're not playing that well. Uh, they are they're a really scary team in that in that sense. They can come out and just run you over for a few points. And and what's not that anything is necessarily going like majorly wrong for UNC. They've lost to two really really good teams uh, in Carleton and and UVM. But what's what's not working as well for them as it did a year ago? Uh, I, I think one of the big problems is that the, uh, before their offense was basically unstoppable. They could just march the disc at will. I mean, when you have Teresa Yu, Alex Barnett, Ellie Youngs, like yeah, you just you get you get the ball moving like that. They they were so they put so much pressure on the other team that the that you basically were not going to get breaks against UNC. You might get one or two on a good day. Like it, it, it's so much pressure, and their offense just isn't like that anymore. They're a bit more profligate with the disc. Uh, yeah, they can ask Don Colton to go out there, but she and Erica Birdsong and Teresa Yu like have a have a big workload and have to play both ways in some cases. Uh, so I think that that's the big difference for them. It's just their O line is not the efficient machine that it had been in years past, which is totally understandable given the talent and experience that they've lost. Uh, they've also had a couple of injuries, I think, that have hurt them a little bit. They're not as deep as before. So when they lose key O-line players, I think that is a bit more taxing on their team than it than it has been in other years. Uh, but I, I, I'm not like – they're they're still obviously an elite team, but they're just no longer – you know, the team at the target, they're, they're not front running right now. The, people aren't just staring at, the, at their backs hoping to catch up anymore. Uh, last thought here, Tufts um, goes 6-1. and one. They lose to UNC 9-8. to eight. Uh, They've lost three games this year, twice to UNC, once to Vermont. Uh, otherwise, they've kind of mopped up against mostly lower-level competition. Kind of hard to get a feel for how good this team is. Do you put them in the semis conversation? They, they, yes, I, I do, and I, I, I have some misgivings. Right, their, their best results is this nine eight loss to UNC, and you know what I say, red flag when your best results a loss. Uh, but they also like, you know, but they put a hurting on a Michigan team that looked pretty good. I think acquitted themselves quite well despite uh, a quarterfinal loss at this tournament. I thought Michigan looked pretty good, so that win over Michigan that they have for Commonwealth Cup, I think, looks even better. Uh, I think that Tufts is, is strong. They're, they're in that semifinals conversation. Like if you're looking at the big three of UBC, Vermont and UNC and saying that that fourth slot is available and maybe Carl, maybe Carl, maybe it's a big four. Um, I think Carl, I don't know. Has to be considered uh, if, a part of that group. Yeah. So you, so you have, you have this four team group at the top, but I think that there's going to be teams that think we could break into that spot. And I think, you know, your Tufts, your Stanford's, your Oregon's, your Colorado's like those, those teams are, I kind of grouped together in that same bucket. But I think this was overall a good showing for Tufts. Like they had a real chance of beating UNC in that game. Uh, they did. This, I know one point is it was, it was, it was a windy weekend. You could see that in, in the scores. They had a real shot at beating UNC in that game. I mean, it was like six, six, they were, they were going to the nail. Uh, so I, I think that this was a good weekend overall for Tufts. It looks good for them. I also think it was a good weekend for Michigan, a little bit disappointing weekend for Pennsylvania, good weekend for Northeastern. Uh, so, you know, down, down the ballot, there's there's some notable results, but uh, I don't I think this was a a confirmed what we already thought about Tufts more than oh they're way better than we thought they were. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that is the end of the college regular season. We await the final bid allocation, and we'll be able to start breaking that all down very soon and get you ready for regionals. Uh, excited to announce that we will have live video coverage of regionals around the country on Sunday of both regionals weekends. So stay tuned for that. Well, more details to come once we have final allocations um, and we get a sense of where we're going to be able to to send cameras. So, uh, but either way, it's going to be appointment viewing. So make sure you get yourself a subscription to tune into that standard or all access, and you can of course join the Ultra World Discord and also get access to all of our out the back bonus segments, including today's, which will be about the upcoming World Championships, the first we've had in eight years in Ultimate. Keith, it's time to play some small ball. Oh yeah, we got uh, we got a couple different things to uh, to talk about here in uh, in small ball. But uh, one thing, uh, 
you know, it, the, the ball may be small, but the, the player we're talking about is, is not. Uh, and that's Jeff Babbitt in the AUDL leaving the New York empire. Uh, this is a, 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 what a bit of a, a LeBron esque move. There was like a whole announcement that he's going to be leaving the empire. We're going to wait his selection. Where's he going to land uh, kind of thing. And would you call this a homecoming here? He's going back. He's going to the Boston glory. Uh, and you know, they're picking up an MVP candidate for a team that was like on the fringes of the playoffs. Uh, obviously a big signing. I mean, number one, I'm glad that Babbitt's in a position where he feels like he can play. That's the biggest thing to me. I mean, there, there were talks I, th- that I straight up thought he, he was going to retire. He's got to take time off. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, thought he was done. If not retire. So uh, it's great that, that he's going to be playing. He's a super talented player uh, and going to be a big impact for the league. What's your take on, on what this does for Boston and how this shifts the balance of power uh, out east in, in the ADL? Well, first, I mean, let's just note. First of all, it's the UFA, Keith. It's not the AUDL anymore. And uh, you, I'm the UFA. The same You're right. I'm. I'm going to make the same mistake. So don't. So don't worry. Um, he. So. Big big drama in New York. To be honest, uh, neither side is really opening up about what exactly the details are. But having talked to a lot of people about this, the uh, the general sense is that the Empire. By the way, let's just start with this. The Empire are the most generous team in the UFA when it comes to compensation. Uh, Players make real money. Many of them are given housing as part of their compensation package, uh, which, you know, in this part of the country is worth thousands of dollars a month. Um, And so this is, uh, you know, and they're willing to go out and spend money on players. And... So Jeff Babbitt has been living in a house uh, by himself for the last couple of years uh, as a part of his Empire contract. And the my understanding is that the Empire kind of late in the offseason said that they wanted to have another person stay in the house uh, as a roommate. And Jeff was not really interested in that at this point in his life and um, kind of t- tried to negotiate with the Empire about this point. And then, I don't know, it got acrimonious, uh, both sides feeling frustrated with the other, and they were not able to come to contractual terms on an arrangement there. So Jeff is out. Um, it was not pretty. And I don't think, you know, this. Uh, it's, it's kind of crazy because Babbitt has been kind of like a cornerstone player for this franchise that they thought was going to be here forever. And now they leave on bad terms. And Jeff goes in in division, not that that's a big surprise, to play for a rival team that was in the playoffs last year. So let's just talk about his potential impact. Uh, I think a dangerous goal scorer and obviously an incredibly capable defender is a big upgrade for Boston. Uh, Do I think this is enough for them to get past D.C. or New York? Probably not, but you know, think about the fact that he's leaving New York as well. Uh, th- th- that is a balance of power change that at least makes you think. Uh, unfortunately for Boston, I think that the the franchise is in a little bit too much disarray uh, for this to really like lock them in for like a, a big season or something because they're just losing too many other good players. I think they're going to be competitive. Uh, I think Jeff helps them be better whether he plays O, D, or both. But um, I don't think this upgrades them for me past either of the other top teams in the East. Do, do they still have a ride cable? Because uh, good luck trying to guard a ride cable and Jeff Abbott on the same field together. <laughs> uh, I think he's. I think he's gone. I'm. I'm going to check, but I, I. I don't. I don't think he's playing with them this season. Big big pickup. I. I do wonder if the implication here. Is that he's getting a better deal from Boston? Like, what you can't leave, leave the New York team based on this, based on this contract dispute, and take a worse contract, right? I I wouldn't be surprised. Do we know if the it's terms? Worse, I I think it's probably a much worse contract. I Maybe think less that it was that ugly in New York. I I don't know oh that for gosh. sure, but I yeah. I mean, look, they're gonna have I wonder, some. I wonder if know, we'll learn more details. They're, they're going to be a good team, Boston, right? Chris Bartoli is a great defender, another big, um, you know, Ben Sadok launching bombs to Jeff Babbitt. It's just like old times, baby. 
yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I think that it's going to be a big deal. But you're right that it doesn't quite give me the, the, uh, the full sell confidence for for Boston. Like, I, I think your points about about their team history and their their roster changes and stuff is are, are well taken. Um, other items to get to, uh, maybe maybe going to involve Charlie and I. Uh, there there <laughs> is an ESPN Plus documentary that premieres on April 10th called tryouts. Uh, they follow, uh, basically people trying out for various teams across different sports. Uh, many of them are, uh, smaller, like non-traditional sports like ultimate. And there is an ultimate episode about the USA under 24 tryouts. Uh, that premieres on May 15th. It's like kind of halfway through the season for them or so. Um, uh, Charlie and I are, are, were interviewed for the show and, uh, we don't know whether we, whether we'll make the cut. So, uh, that'll be part of, part of watching. Uh, but you know, there, there are a number of players that are covered in the episode. I saw Claire Stewart uh, announced that she's one of the players that is featured in the episode, uh, about ultimate, but I'll be very curious about what's going on for the show. Uh, and I think we have a little bit of a trailer to share. Let's take a look. This is an audition. Ooh, this is what I've worked up to. This is the moment. Go. Everybody is fine for a job. Not everybody's going to make it. I'm getting scared. I want the best of the best. If we're not confident you can be part of our team, you're done. I need you to believe in yourself. Y'all got my heart and my kneecap. There is no option. We're making the dream happen. Yeah! Woo! Ah! I'm fired up. I'm fired up. I'm looking forward to checking it out. It's going to be a no whole new way to experience what the tryouts are like for a U.S. national team. We've, we, we, no, no one's ever had this amount of access uh, to what the experience is like, and especially being there for it and then being there when the players find out. Awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely in for the behind-the-scenes access. I'm also curious about how Ultimate is presented by – you know, a non endemic production group, uh, you're going to have the ability to compare directly with how these other sports are presented. I mean, there's like monster truck racing. I saw the poster, you know, like cheer, like how, how is ultimate presented? Uh, I think they're going to take it super seriously. These other sports are. I think they're going to so take too. it super seriously. Like that's the whole concept of this is it's like alt sports and like tryouts for big teams. And so I think it'll be, it's not going to be stoner nonsense. No, I mean, I, I like go ahead. We somebody get the bingo card ready. Like, will they mention disc golf? Will they mention dogs? You know, the, all the stuff. <laughs> I, I, I'm not I mean, really, some of that might happen. You know, that stuff. I'm, I'm more, con I'm more interested in how they decide to film the game. You know, how how do they decide to show the game off uh, visually sure. as compared to how they how they show other sports. Uh, but very curious. Uh, uh, you know, obviously want to see if if we made the cut. Want to see if we got on, on the screen. Or if we're on the editorial room floor somewhere. What's next, Keith? Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, the last item for, for this week, Western Ultimate League, they're in week two of action. And Charlie, absolutely shocking result here. Seattle losing to Bay, the Bay Area by eight goals. They lost 18 to 10, I think, was the final score in that one just absolutely blown out by a team that was 0-1 that had lost their first game of the season. Seattle now 0-2 in the season. The two-time champions are flailing and coming off the worst loss in team history. And to me, one of the biggest upsets in the league's history. Uh, shocking result for Seattle. And a week after Bay Area lost to Utah on the road. It's hard to go on the road and win in this league. Okay, that's that's number one takeaway. Number two for me though is I think I I think I understated the losses. I thought that the the reinforcements that they had, many very good players joining the roster this year, would offset the players that departed. I am now no longer believing that. I, I there's no way that you can look at this team as the favorite anymore. San Diego, uh, all the way, you know, they go on the road and win in Seattle, and to me, it's like. Can anybody catch up with San Diego? Because that's uh, Seattle looks uh, cooked. Yeah, I mean, hey, San Diego got a tough test uh, playing against uh, Colorado too. So they, so San Diego got a got got their own challenge. Uh, I, I think the league's actually shown a lot of parity, which is why it's even more wild that Seattle got dogged. Like 
I mean, <laughs> there, there, there hasn't been a single other blowout through the, in the entire league aside from this one. So really surprising result. And I, when we talked about in the preseason about Seattle, I was like, can they adjust to having a shift in the structure of the team? And in my understanding, they're still running the like, oh, we're going to run three lines evenly. Like we're super deep. Like that's how we win. Uh, are they going to go back to the, Are they going to panic? Are they going to go to the drawing board? Like what, what are going to be the adjustments from here? Because obviously they're got to be disappointed with the start to the season. Uh, it, it's not a long season. Uh, these L's add up quickly. Yep. Uh, Pre- Premier Ultimate League starts this weekend, Keith. We got uh, we got three games on deck. Time to make some picks, I think. Well, I, I think we got. I think what do, what do, what do we want to do? Our championship weekend picks here, or uh, or just the just the games for the week? What do you want? How do you want to do it? Well, let's let's pick for the week, and then I think we also need to to stake our claim for uh, yeah for championship weekend and who's going to win it all. Um, we'll start with this weekend's games. We've got Nightshade, uh, that's Nashville at Indianapolis. We've got DC at Raleigh. And we've got Atlanta at Austin. Um, what are you going, Keith? Well, two we'll of these picks, I think, are pr- I think two of these two of these picks are pretty easy. I think one of these <laughs> games is going to take up all the airspace in here. I mean, uh, Nashville and Atlanta, both teams that feel like they have less talent than they did last year, and they were, you know, uh, Night Shade was okay last year, but Atlanta's coming off a tough season. Uh, Indies on the up. Uh, Austin's been pretty consistent. I easily favor the home teams there. Agreed. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to assume well. you're the same, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. DC I, and Raleigh, I'm, I'm though, you. that's where that's where the drama is at. I mean, these two could be the two best teams in the league this year. Yeah, I um, I'm going to take Raleigh just because they're playing at home, but I, I will not be surprised at all if DC wins. I think the line is probably right around a pick them. Um, if this was, game was at DC, I'd probably call it DC minus two. Um, but uh, give me Raleigh in the in the in the opener here. All right, I'll take the other side of that. Um, I like I like DC's new additions uh, a little bit more. I think they've got an exciting group coming in. Uh, it is a road game. That's good. That is definitely a point in Raleigh's favor. I think they probably have one of the best home advantages in the league, uh, and they're still going to be extremely talented team. But uh, I'll take I'll take DC on the other end of that. Okie doke. Um, so let's talk um, championship weekend. Who are you taking? Oh, um, well, I, I mean, it's hard to get away from DC and Raleigh. I feel like, I mean, I feel like those, those to me, you feel like the favorites in the league to start the year. Although I know, uh, I know over on double overtime, they were very hyped, uh, about the surge this year. So, oh, tough, tough to pick, uh, how we're going to end up with the, 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 these two divisions, you know, the North is, is so good too. So you got, you got Philly and New York, like what's New York going to look like this year. You got Minnesota. Oh man. New York is, is a I mean, wild I definitely, roster. It's uh, crazy, but like, how are you going to bet against Manu and, and Vale? Right? Like, well, you're uh, not, but are they going to play I'm all the games? I bet they won't. I bet they won't play right. all the games. So they're probably going to take uh, else. Cause down the roster, this team's not that deep. I think I got to take Raleigh and in DC and then I'll take, I don't know, man. It's like Manu and volley versus Minnesota minus Robin. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely taking Philly to make it this year. No, no drama needed. I'll take Philly, New York. So I'm going to, I'll take Philly, New York, DC and Raleigh at a uh, championship again. I think, I think Philly is an easy choice. I think Raleigh and DC are easy choices. Oh gosh, so much of it's about schedule. I I like Minnesota here actually. I just don't think I can count. I, I I've believed in New York for so long, and all they've done is break my heart every single time, Keith. Like, <laughs> I, I just I just don't see it. Um, I, yeah, I but think, it's a whole. It's basically know, a whole new team. <laughs> if they have all their players, that's I don't think that's a good thing. Even adding Manu yeah, and Bale, <laughs> assuming like. If those players are there for all the games, then okay. Then they they probably they have a great chance to beat anybody. But I don't know. The strike, they, they, they're going to be really solid, right? They pick up Tory Gray. They pick up Erica Bacon. Um, yes, they lose Robin, but like, you know, Max, Daniel Byer. Like, they're, they're really, really solid, and they're a lot deeper than New York. So I'm going to take Minnesota. 
and to win it all perfectly justifiable i think i gotta go i think i gotta go dc to win it all Mm. i think that the, the additions balance out the losses for me You going Raleigh again? Yeah. Um, back to back. That's tough. I, I honestly, I, I'm really trying right now to talk myself into Philly, but <laughs> do it. They haven't been there. They have before, such a chip on their know? shoulder. They're, such a chip on their shoulder. They, they really do. And the, the like, so many returners. They're just adding talent. Like they're going to be better this year, but it's like when you get to championship weekend, that championship experience goes a long way. And uh, these other two teams are kind of replete with that. Uh, man, it, it makes no sense to pick Raleigh after I just picked DC to win this game, but I don't want to pick this whole thing <laughs> as you. But, you know, I'll do, I'll do it. Th- that feels like a Raleigh thing to do. Lose to DC in the regular season and then come back and beat him at championship weekend. I'll take, I'll take Radiance. that basically what they did this past year? Like, right. That's literally That's the recipe. <laughs> um, all right. It's time for our question of the week, Keith. What do we got? All right, question of the week coming from our Discord. Of course, uh, you can always ask us in the Discord for your questions if you want to be potentially featured in our question of the week segment. This one comes from Lubes in the Discord. What are the best individual performances in a national final club or college? Ooh, best individual performances. Um, I'll just hit you with some off the top. Uh, Mac hacked and Jr in the 2019 college men's final. Um, Dina with a miraculous run really through the entire bracket, but you know, the, was the, the, uh, the mermaid catch that was, that was in the final. That right? was the mermaid. That and was like the mermaid the catch, the layout on, hand block. On Verzu. Oh or the layout yeah. Yeah. What a monster game. And, and, you know, to basically power that team to that win, you know, going upwind. It was awesome. Awesome. Um, how about club Keith? What are some that come to mind? Um, oh, well you, you, you skipped over, over Verzu absolutely dominating against Texas. I mean, to me, that is the, the most dominant performance I've ever that, seen from a that was epic. In a and that, that was after I mean, that was just had like, 10 goals and semis. Yeah. And just absolute wrecking ball. I mean, that was, <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever seen a single player go out and win a, win a title more than in that game. That, that is the definitive performance in, in my mind. Um, from club. Hmm. What are some of the best in club? Who's, it's who's rare been, for what, one what did Joe White just put up last year? Go absolutely monster in the final. It's like depth is so much more important. Usually. trying to think back some of those revolver teams but like i i don't remember individual star performances that much um you know like lena troutman had a really good game this past season mm-hmm. in the final uh you know and 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 really throughout the entire tournament the like the the, the imports were huge uh, but you know, like uh, uh, Brood is so deep. I feel like Ma- Manu had a really great game. I feel like in uh in two years ago when Molly Brown won. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything we can think of in mixed too. Uh, maybe Nikki I mean, Spiva. Uh, for honestly, amp. like in an unflashy way, like Mario O'Brien and Cheryl Sue had amazing games uh, mm-hmm. to win BFG their title. Just like rock handling. Um, but Bo is definitely back in the day had some crazy games. But it's hard to disentangle like bracket performances from like specifically the finals for me. So yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's it's surprisingly it's surprisingly hard to come up with individual players because so often it's about like the ability. You know, college is different because like a really really great player can have a hugely outsized impact on the game in a in a way that's just more rare in club. I think. I'm I'm sure we will get yelled at if we don't mention. Was it was Carolyn Finney 
the one where she had like 11 out of 12 or something in the finals uh was that a, that was in the finals and not semis i think like 2011 that, that's ish i couldn't tell you oh in college we're, we're dig- yeah in college oh, yeah, with, mean, with uc Santa Barbara. there's all kinds of that kind uh, of stuff. Also, yeah Tul- tulsa douglas famously uh oh yeah Josie i mean Gillette. d3 is wild <laughs> d3 is wild yeah <laughs> Uh, H- Hanky for Oklahoma Christian, just like basically single handedly winning them the game. Um, Bat- Batch in the chat says Chase Chase Sparling Beckley with access of Seville. The one year, the best player in the entire men's division was just like, sure, I'll just play with a mixed team for a year, take some to a national championship. And oh my God, what a wild story that was. Uh, just, just a, uh, one of the greatest players of all time, just jumping on for within some random mixed team, you know? <laughs> crazy um all right subs only segment we're about to start it over in discord in just a moment and we're talking world's preview we of course know the u.s national team and ravi vasudevan is going to join us again to talk about all of the european and other international teams that are there um hey we got a very special extra uh deep look bonus episode dropping tomorrow you're not going to want to miss it video and all it's going to be fun that is going to do it for this edition of Deep Look. Thank you so much for tuning in. For Keith Rayner, I'm Charlie Eisen. saying so long. We'll talk to you next week right here on Deep Look.